Welcome, everyone. I'm Amal Andraus. I'm the dean of the school, and I'm really thrilled to be uh, having you all today in our school and also hosting this amazing conference. Um, you should know that it's, well, we don't sell, but if we did sell, it would be sold out. Uh, and uh, and the, just the response has been you know, incredible, and it's so exciting to have um, scholars and practitioners from across the disciplines of technology and the built environment, and I see alumni and, uh, you know, thinking about change, in fact, uh, and how we deal with change. Everything is uh, moving so fast. The systems that we once established are being transformed, and it's not clear whether it's always for the better. Um, and so for us to uh, come together to think about these changes and their impacts and how we can kind of redirect them and harness them and make them visible and understand them and present them in a new way uh, and find new modes of collaboration, I think is uh, what we're all kind of here today to assemble ar around urgent questions. And in general, um, uh, I think this is the urgency that we find ourselves in where institutions and disciplines are both unable to adapt and yet this is what we have to transform and retool. Um, and I'm particularly excited that the conference was uh, really masterminded by Leah Meisterlin, um, who is, as you know, assistant professor here at the school. But uh, even more importantly, I think Leah is one of the kind of seed bridges uh, that uh, we have, you know, sort of put forth in the hope of stitching back together uh, architecture and urban planning and this body that was once divided needs to act um, as one again in new ways and I think Leah's uh, you know unbelievable contribution already even within a few years to uh, single-handedly transforming uh, the kind of thinking and work of both architecture and planning students makes me hopeful so please welcome Leah Meisterlin good morning I'm so excited. Okay. I'll, I'll admit, I've been excited for today in many ways much longer than it takes to uh, organize a conference. Um, I want to start by thanking the school and uh, the Dean Amal especially uh, for the support you've given to this conference and uh, that support is very much appreciated and very deeply felt. I want to thank Lila um, Catelier and her, uh, her entire events and communications teams. Um, none of this is possible without your enthusiasm and your wizardry. Um, and I want to thank all of our participants from whom you will hear today, uh, participants, contributors, and of course the moderators as well, for your time, uh, your attention, your interest, your work, and your care. Um, because honestly, well rather, I'd like to start as honestly as I can uh, by saying that I don't exactly know where to begin. Um, I do know that somewhere, at some point in the last decade, I lost count of the many irrevocably consequential changes in the digital material landscape of cities. And I lose track consistently, trying to follow the socio-political, cultural, and economic processes that flow across, um, through, and against those landscapes. I have lost count of the devices and the disruptions, the platforms and the predictions. I have lost track of the algorithmic and artificial, automated and autonomous. I suspect some of you are like me in this regard. I am losing count of the new ways to count, and by that mechanism, the ways we determine who counts. Um, I'm afraid I'm losing track of everything that's designed to track, and of course, we're here because in both of those cases, we're really talking about people. We're talking about technologies designed to count and track people. We're here to talk about digital technologies and cities, which might mean very many different things today. Um, but for me, at least right now, I mean the collection of connective platforms, computational processes, and informational infrastructures that are reorganizing, restructuring, and in many cases, simply accelerating social and capital relations within cities and across regions. And specifically accomplishing this by changing the means by which places and people, neighborhoods and communities are designed, planned, conceived, imagined, operated, and represented. So, 
Here's a quick, really close to home and admittedly advantageously current example. Think of WeWork six months ago and think of WeWork today. Whatever happens internally for that organization, in New York, WeWork is not exactly a startup, but a technological intervention into the very code of the city's planning and its socioeconomic reproduction. As New York City's largest tenant, it is worth asking what happens if WeWork doesn't make its rent, and whether New Yorkers will have to decide that this particular firm is now too big to fail. I can reframe that question as one of technological and built scale. It's worth asking whether commercial rent arbitrage, predicated on precarious labor and facilitated by fastidious data collection and analysis, that is, counting and tracking, right, has scaled beyond the units of desks per week and conference rooms per hour into something not only larger but qualitatively different, something that involves and implicates all of us. Put yet another way, where is the line? What is the scalar threshold between space as a service and space as a responsibility? WeWork is just one example. Think ride sharing and autonomous vehicles. Consider e-commerce logistics and personal GPS enabled wayfinding and, and routing. Crime mapping and predictive policing or social media based targeted advertising. Their internal logics, their scale and reach their math, their hardware, and their impacts on human urban environments are not dissimilar. Among their commonalities, they all involve spatial technologies of sensing and extraction, extracting information as commodity, as material, extracting attention, labor, and time, and particularly in a spatially regulated democracy, extracting votes. We know that now. Okay, so before this gets too dark, <laughs> um, I, don't act, I don't think we're here to talk about the good, the bad, and the optimized, right? Um, and I won't speak for everyone, but I'm not here to uh, personally to vilify smart city sales pitches, or, nor am I here uh, necessarily to accept um, techno-positivism or the techno-optimism that usually follows it. Rather, I am so excited which means I will stop talking soon so that we can get into it. Um, I'm so excited because across today, we will hear about digitality, um, high-powered counting, right? In terms that involve and implicate all of us in research, in design, in action, and in outcome, in the messy, inefficient, ambiguous, conflicted, diverse terms of urbanism, plural. The pluralism of cities, the co-location and simultaneity of different communities and their spatial practices and priorities presents challenges that plainly digital technologies cannot resolve by definition. And thus, it recalls questions and challenges that are absolutely not new. Those of access and distribution, inclusion and marginalization, equity and justice, these are questions of responsibility and obligation. So, plan for the morning. I'm going to very quickly introduce uh, the moderators for the two morning panels, who will in turn introduce you to our incredible and generous speakers. Um, if you haven't already, please grab a program, uh, which does include full bios and abstracts. Um, they're up there. Um, we will have two panels, like I said, before we break for lunch, and each of them with three presentations followed by a discussion. I'm going to go in reverse order. Our second panel on systems of representation will be moderated by Mark Wasuda, co-director of the Critical, Curatorial, and Conceptual Practices in Architecture program here at GSAP. Among his many um, other super interesting projects is ongoing research and exhibition work, uh, Control Syntax, examining smart city forms and formulations and the processes of computational urbanism they prescribe and otherwise engender. Before that panel, I would like to invite up Malo Hudson, Associate Professor in Urban Planning, also here at Columbia GSAP, and Director of the school's Urban Community and Health Equity Lab. His work sits at the intersection of community development and health equity, with a specific mind toward racial and ethnic inequalities. And while not in your official bio, I also think your, um, Malo's recent work on circular economies were, warrants uh, mentioning, because it could certainly be of interest to our discussion. So thank you very much.
Thank you for the kind introduction and for inviting me here. As Leah said, I'm Malo Hudson. I want to welcome you all to Columbia. And I want to start off by first thanking Dean Amal Andros. I think that when you when you think about urban planning and architecture and the built in, in you know, urban design and thinking about the built environment overall, you have to think about innovation and where we're going as a society. And so one of the things I'm um, so proud about being a part of GSAP is, is the vision in this department, um, or in the school, I should say, and how we think about innovation, technology, and so forth. And so I look forward to today's discussion. Um, I also want to thank my colleague, Leah Meisterlin, who's um, been very humble. Uh, but I would have to say it's, it's a pleasure to watch you as a young scholar and put something so important like this together and having uh, the leadership to do so. And, to, and I know it takes a lot of time, but I hope today you can uh, see all of that hard work has paid off. Um, so anyway, a big uh, again, I want to thank you for that. <laughs> so as I was thinking about moderating this panel, I thought about my own work and whatnot, and 20 years ago, I started my doctoral program at MIT. I had the opportunity to work with people like uh, William Mitchell, uh, Stephen Graham, and Manuel Castells, and many of us as young doctoral students were thinking about the growth of technology, certainly Silicon Valley was taking off, and we didn't talk about digital urbanisms then. We were thinking about those concepts, but didn't have it quite, le quite defined like it is today, but we're thinking about information technology. And what role would technology play in altering our daily lives in terms of where we live, where we work, thinking about mobility in general, thinking about inequality, opportunity. There was a big discussion about the digital divide and all of those things. And so I went back last night and looked at our old uh, journals, of our uh, student journals, and there was a whole thing on uh, information technology and, making, and place making. Uh, and so I'd have to say we've come a long way. And so the uh, panel that we're, I'm going to moderate is on infrastructures and digi digi digital materiality. And part of that, again, goes back to many of the same themes we were talking about before, but certainly much more advanced. But thinking about the role of uh, digital technologies in our everyday lives, whether that be sensors, whether that be uh, big data, whether that be privacy, security, all the things that we think about now um, and so I would like to um, uh, bring up our first panelist, who will talk about, and I'll introduce one by one, but that will begin to move us in this direction. So the first panelist is Narissa Moray, and I'll give it, their bios are in the, you know, in the booklet, but I'll say a few things. But uh, Narissa is a strategic planner and project manager who has worked extensively with both public and private sector clients on urban innovation, parks and open space, coastal planning and real estate, and economic development projects. At present, she's an associate director of America's most innovative urban development project, Sidewalk Toronto. And part of this with Sidewalk Toronto is really thinking about the role um, that technology, new technologies can play to improve the lives of urban citizens, thinking about the digital, the physical, and also policy and financing. And so the case she'll present today will really uh, dive into the issues around urban mobility, or urban mobility and thinking about new systems, sustainability and stormwater infrastructure, and outcome-based building code. So with that said, with that said please uh, give a warm welcome to Narissa Moray. I'm going to go a little shallow and, and wide today rather than deep, so uh, hopefully that will be okay. But I think that the project that I'm working on in Toronto can introduce so many of the ideas that are going to be talked about not only in our panel, but later on this afternoon. So I wanted to kind of give you a touchstone across the, the whole of the project. Um, but also I wanted to talk a little bit at the beginning just about Sidewalk Labs, where I work, what we look for and think about in projects, as well as then introduce the Sidewalk Toronto project as a case study. Um, so it's no surprise to the crowd here today you know, that cities are f ever facing more um, struggles and challenges in quality of life as we uh, face continued urbanization around the world. And in response to this, we've always looked to technology through the ages. But we know from history that technology can have both um, positive and negative outcomes. And that's you know, s absolutely still true for what we're facing now in sort of this next digital revolution. We have to think really carefully about the impacts that what we do are going to have on the communities and society around us. 
So Sidewalk Labs was actually um, formulated to think about these questions. It's a company that's often sort of characterized as a smart city company. But actually what's interesting is that the vast majority of, of people working at Sidewalk are geeky urban planners and architects and engineers. Um, and they're mixed together with um, uh, technologists. Uh, but these are people, most of us, coming from having worked for the cities, with cities, uh, and we are sort of looking for that spot, um, looking for opportunity without bringing on the negative consequences. So we do this by looking at all areas of innovation. So today we're talking about digital innovation, but in fact the company uh, looks at innovation across the board. So we look at materials innovation, we look at policy and financing, all of the tools that you have to look at in the toolkit to think about quality of life. Because the way we think of ourselves as a firm is actually as a firm that's looking at increasing quality of life for citizens. It's not about putting some digital layer on with nothing else. It's really looking at the outcomes that all of these different kind of new innovations can bring um, in cities. So we've um, organized the company in what we call five pillars. And this is important because all of these parts of projects uh, of city making we think are equally important. So it's social infrastructure, buildings and housing, mobility, public realm, and sustainability with an emphasis on climate positive. We don't think that projects can, can or should be undertaken without all of these areas being investigated. Again, it's not just about sticking some sort of digital technology on top, it's about looking at how can all of these different areas um, be taken together to really improve outcomes for citizens. <laughs> So how do we think about sort of implementing that or as a framework for projects? We think of these five um, pillars as sort of different physical layers in the environment with the um, digital layer as just one more of those. And all together, these sort of six different elements together are a framework for looking or approaching a project. So what does that mean in terms of a real project? Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about Sidewalk Toronto in this context. So Toronto, Sidewalk Toronto is a project, uh, it's 15 acres of land on the eastern waterfront in Toronto. It's uh, on the very far east of the waterfront, but still, that being said, it's only 15 or 20 minutes walk from the major um, transportation hub in downtown Toronto. So it's very close to the downtown area. It's a brownfield, uh, uh, landfill, ex-industrial site with uh, almost no tenancy on it at the moment. It's uh, owned by Waterfront Toronto, which is a tripartite uh, government organization with uh, representatives from the city, from the province, and from the federal government. And they've been uh, uh, developing the waterfront over the last 15 or 20 years. They're quite progressive, so they've been doing a lot of progressive um, development of the waterfront in downtown Toronto. And so with this project, which is one of the last parcels of land they have, they were really looking to kind of move the bar on uh, innovation uh, with the development. So they went out with an RFP for the site, particularly looking for an innovation and financing partner. So we responded to the RFP and uh, we won. Uh, in 2017, right at the end of the year. And what did we win? We won the right to actually prepare a plan for the site. So that plan has to be ratified by government, by both Waterfront Toronto and the city as well. Um, but that's what we've been doing is preparing that plan over the last year and a half. And it was presented to uh, Waterfront Toronto in June of this past summer. Um, one of the reasons we were interested in the project in Toronto is that Waterfront Toronto's goals for the project are very similar to what we're interested in. So they're interested in job creation, housing, sustainability, mobility, and urban, in urban innovation. It felt like a really great fit for us. They're looking holistically at the project and holistically at the outcomes that they want by developing this parcel of land. So how do we approach a project from the beginning? Well, because we are a kind of geeky group of urban planners and so on, we, we do look at it just you know, from a normal lens of urban design and urban planning at the beginning. We look at what the relationship of the site is to the surrounding city. We look at the connectivity. We look at what the public spaces are gonna be. Um, in Keyside, the name of the site is the Keyside site. Um, we're excited to have three new public spaces that we're gonna be bringing online, and so um, our design team and landscape architects have been looking at, at how to design those spaces. Um, but today, since we're talking about digital, um, digital uh, layers and the digital um, architecture, what I wanted to do is for each of these different pillars, like for public space, sort of talk about the digital layer that we see for each of these. So for example, um, for public space, we're really interested in being able to enable more people more of the time to be outside and to be using public space. 
So we think about that through basic design, but we also think about the digital layer and how that can help to um, realize that outcome. So whether it's something like uh, weather mitigation structures that are tied to real-time data about the weather that can deploy different structures and protect different areas of the site to make it more, uh, more usable outdoor space whether it's flexible multi-space uh, areas that have a digital architecture underlayer that make the space uh, flexible so that communities can adapt that space in many different ways, whether it be today or next week or 10 years in the future when the needs of the community change. Um, whether it's ubiquitous connectivity and Wi-Fi to kind of lower the um, digital access and digital divide for people in the neighborhood. Or whether it's developing tools so that the community can um, self-manage uh, its own programming, advocate for what they want in, a, in, uh, uh, in spaces. Um, these are all different ways or different um, tools we look at for using a digital layer to actually provide those outcomes that we look for. So mobility is the same way. The actual um, most important backbone of mobility for the site to us is transit. You know, in any dense urban area, having great public transit is the most important thing we feel. So it, here in Toronto, what we're actually uh, pushing there is uh, new financing vehicles for financing extension of the uh, LRT through neighborhoods to the west of us and then through our site. So that's actually not a digital layer, it's actually a financing tool, but I want to mention it because it's the most important thing to us. Um, but then we're also interested in uh, lots of other um, digital infrastructure developments as well. So for us, um, public, the reduction of public, uh, sorry, the reduction of private car owner trip and private car trips is one of our most important outcomes for mobility. So how do we do that? We look to um, uh, obviously support public transit, but also to make act active transportation um, more attractive. So we do that, for example, through adaptive traffic signals and bicycle greenways. Uh, adaptive traffic signals can help speed the LRT faster, um, so give it better performance times. It can make si uh, si uh, crosswalks safer towards the vision zero uh, goals by having sort of adaptive traffic, uh, adaptive crosswalks in the sidewalk. And it can use things like the bicycle green wave to um, speed up uh, travel by bicycles and make their transit through uh, uh, signals more safe. Um, one of the things I'm particularly uh, interested in is our curb management, a dynamic curb. Um, we're planning for the streets in Keyside uh, to be curbless, um, mm -hmm. also to have no parking on the street and no parking lanes. So here in the bottom two pictures on the slide, you can see uh, sort of what would be traditionally thought of sidewalk. Um, on the left, there's a car, it's pulling in, it's a drop-off and pickup zone that's variably used in high peak times as you know, for uh, vehicles, but then in off-peak times, you can use it um, uh, as public space. So you're reclaiming space back um, as one of the goals, is more space for more people more of the time, um, but also by um, emphasizing ride sharing and pick up and drop off rather than private car ownership, you're also working towards that goal uh, of lowering private car ownership. And you know, this can only be done through data. You need to first be able to manage a pick up and drop off zone. You need to be able to manage a sidewalk used in different ways at different times. You need to know who's coming in uh, and going out, or at least you need to know the, the volume and capacity of that, rather than personal details about anybody, but volumes and capacities to be able to plan um, this, this kind of infrastructure. For buildings innovation, again, our most exciting facet is not a digital facet, but I'm still going to mention it, um, which is that this would be the first district built um, with mass tall timber. Uh, all the buildings are planned to be built with tall timber, and they'd also be the tallest buildings um, in the world. Um, this is enabled by digital processes. Uh, it's enabled by um, designs of a modular kit of parts and a digital fabrication process that would take um, sourcing of timber through factories and into construction. What we're most excited about this is that it, it um, results in incredible construction time savings, which equates into cost savings, which for us, we put back into affordable housing. Um, I want to mention the outcome-based code quickly, uh, but the, um, there's, a, there's a, a lot of use of uh, environmental sensing for industrial uses uh, and for environmental uh, monitoring. But we think that a similar kind of um, technology can be used within mixed-use developments to allow a greater mix of tenants. So not just residential commercial, but even light industrial. Um, if you want to allow that kind of mix for a more vibrant sort of live-work environment, 
Um, you still have to monitor, you have to know that that's going to be safe, and we think that the technology that's uh, available today can help to do that. Um, uh, all of the um, innovations we're doing in buildings, as I said, uh, are resulting in something we're very proud of, which is a commitment to a 40% uh, below market housing at Keyside. This will be two to three times more affordable housing that's been uh, delivered by anybody else on any of the developments in the waterfront in the entire history of the development there. Um, then, in terms of district infrastructure, um, uh, I would say we're introducing a lot of um, sort of innovative technology into district infrastructure. I mean, traditionally, I mean, this, most of this kind of infrastructure already works with control systems. It has digital layers to it already. But there are a number of different um, advances that we're proposing that we're very excited about that uh, really uh, significantly change. Um, for example, with the stormwater management, um, we're, we're proposing to pilot some technology that's actually already piloted here in New York with DEP. They work with um, one of the companies that we're interested in working with. Um, it adds a layer of uh, smart controls to the system, anticipates weather conditions, it can flush out a system before a storm, so there's better retention uh, levels and keeps stormwater out of the municipal system. We're um, predicting a 90% reduction in stormwater into the municipal system through the design that we're proposing at the Keyside site. So it's a, a huge um, um, differential amount. Um, and waste collection, uh, speaking about circular economies, um, one of the things we're excited is the um, implementation of a pneumatic system uh, into the site, but more than that, it's actually the information about um, the recycling that's coming through. We're working with a local uh, materials re uh, recovery and re uh, recycling facility to look at the garbage that's coming through, to be able to provide information back to residents um, about how they're doing on recycling. We think that an education loop, it's really about you know, human activity, that education loop back to residents about how they're doing with recycling is the only way that you can really move the bar uh, on uh, sort of the improvement to recycling and, and waste. We're tar targeting an 80% uh, reduction of landfill uh, for our waste collection at Keyside, which is radical compared to what they have in Toronto today, which I think is somewhere between, in, uh, in uh, multi-tenant buildings, they get somewhere between 17 to 23 um, percent, variably between residential and commercial. Um, but um, one of the other elements we're most excited about is uh, energy systems, because achieving climate positive at Keyside is our, our goal. Um, that comes from just great design uh, at the beginning, passive house designs even for these larger buildings, renewable energy sources. Um, uh, Toronto has a, a pretty green grid, which is great, um, but augmenting that with solar, with geothermal. But then also one thing we're excited about is the use of AI to manage the building. We know that looking at buildings today, we model buildings in a much more sophisticated way. We have ASHRAE standards, all sorts of other standards. Uh, in Toronto, they have slightly different ones, but um, that we use to model buildings and uh, to require for permitting of buildings. But we know actually looking at the performance of buildings in, in true operations, the buildings just aren't performing at the level that they're supposed to according to the models. So why is that? A lot of that is just the human operations of the building. They're simply not uh, able to manage buildings in the way that they're modeled. And so we're really excited. Um, we're developing a series of uh, building controls that will help automate, um, you know, which will absolutely be able to be um, managed and controlled by humans, but also help to uh, take over um, some of the functions that aren't being able to be done today to really radically lower the use of energy in buildings. So the last one uh, I don't want to miss is talking about social infrastructure. Uh, in Toronto, we're not looking at actually providing services. Um, we think that's done uh, very effectively by the government and other community uh, groups and organizations in Toronto. But we're very excited to partner with those kind of uh, groups there. Um, for this, we're really thinking about inclusion and equity, um, whether it's providing digital tools where communities can get more involved in their own programming, whether it's digital literacy programs or whether it's access uh, to digital technology on the site. Um, these are the kind of things that we're very excited to partner with, with local uh, folks to deliver for the project. 
So uh, the result of all that is, you know, a set of uh, outcomes that we're very excited about. 40% below, below market housing, as I mentioned, 85% reduction in greenhouse gases at the site, and a 60% reduction in car trips. These are the metrics that we're aiming for and, and believe we can hit with the project. But having said all that, you know, we are a private company that's going to develop the site. And what does it mean to implement all of these, um, or propose to implement all of this digital infrastructure? I can see some smiles in the front row. So, you know, w one of the other things that I wanted to mention or talk about today is really uh, the framework for how do you govern all that? Because it is incredibly important, and we are do think of ourselves as good actors, and we think it's incredibly important to address um, the implications of all of this. So we've had uh, extensive consultation in Toronto. We've, had, we've met with more than 20,000 Torontonians face-to-face -face in workshops and, and other uh, activities. We've had more than 200,000 people participate in uh, online webinars. We've had um, grant programs and summer fellowships. And we've had a lot of discussion in the press, a lot of discussion in community forums. So some of the um, messages we've been hearing in Toronto are summarized here today. So no tech for tech's sake, no data for data's sake. We shouldn't be gathering or implementing anything that isn't directly tied back to achieving those outcomes uh, that we're aiming for and that the government is interested in. We should build in privacy from the beginning of development of any systems. And then the outputs, whether it's data outputs or whether it's technology that's implemented, those should all be seen as um, resulting in, uh, uh, in prov providing results for the public good. So data that's generated at the site, especially in public realm or on, on land that was originally public, we see that as an asset that should be a public asset. And so we believe that that data should be actually made available to everybody and should not be privatized. And no single entity, whether it's us as a private company, another private company, or even a government agency should uh, be able to monopolize either that technology or the data that results from it. What does that actually mean in practice? How do we take those uh, that kind of feedback and think about how it's actually um, acted on. So one thing that we've done is we've developed a set of um, responsible data use guidelines and an assessment system that we use in-house when we develop all our systems. So we look to make sure that whatever we're developing has beneficial purpose, um, that anything, any data would be publicly accessible de by default, we look for transparency in, uh, in implementation. So what are we implementing? Where is it going to be physically in the environment? What is it collecting? Where does the data go? Who has governance over that data? That should all be clear to the public and to government. If we're developing anything with AI, how do we develop that responsibly, knowing the biases that can go into AI from the very beginning because of the data sets that are used? How do we keep data um, to a minimum, keep it secure, and keep it de-identified de at source and by default? And you know, just frankly speaking, it's been a big, um, I think, misunderstanding in Toronto because we are an alphabet company and we're a sister company at Google. We're interested in urban development. We're not interested in advertising. So we don't, we're not interested in selling, uh, sharing, or using um, personal information, information for advertising in, in any way. That's just not our business model. Um, but it's, a, it's one thing to say that we're doing that for ourselves, but that's, that's certainly not enough. We're still a private company. So we firmly believe that all of this should be overseen by government. So in Toronto, we've um, proposed an urban data trust that would be an independent government entity to oversee, uh, to review plans uh, and uh, plans and you know, systems designs before they would be implemented. Uh, in Toronto, it may not end up being an urban data trust. And one of the things that's been very exciting about the project is that both the city and the provincial government are actually um, doing a uh, refresh, uh, are, are uh, looking at their existing data governance and privacy policies and regulations, and they're actually aiming to update those over the next year, partly in response to the project, uh, which we actually think is a very positive uh, thing, um, because we feel that these, uh, the government should be overseeing uh, what's happening for this type of technology. Um, another thing that we're thinking about is how do you 
uh, how do you bake in that transparency from the very beginning of a project? So one of the things I'm excited about is that we're thinking about um, what materials would we submit with a development, a formal development application to the city. Um, right now in Toronto, I think it's the same in New York, uh, when you hand in, hand in your first application for a project, you don't have to provide any sort of information on a digital architecture of a site. So we're thinking about you know, what kind of system, the architecture diagrams, diagrams that sort of show the layering of the digital and the physical together. What materials could we provide that would make that clear and transparent from the beginning of the project? Uh, then those would be um, sort of reviewed and go through iterations through responsible data uh, assessments and overview. And then at the end, what we think is equally as important is thinking about operational capacity. Um, we don't think that all systems and cities um, should be privatized. We think it should be um, uh, capacity that the government has. So how do you work with government partners through co-creation, through using regulatory processes to educate and to, and to knowledge share with them? How do you do that in a way that you can build capacity on the government side to take over as much as they can uh, of these systems um, into operations of a site? The last thing I wanted to mention was then, you know, that transparency shouldn't end just when the project ends. Um, we think it's really important that people uh, have visibility over uh, this digital layer, which is often, you know, invisible to people. So we've worked with hundreds of um, partners to develop an open standard and visual language. Um, these are icons that would be displayed anywhere digital technology is implemented. They're icons that describe the purpose of the technology, the type of, uh, 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 type of um, equipment that's being used, whether the data is identified or de-identified, who's responsible um, for uh, the project or for the, or for the equipment, uh, and how can you learn more. So today, maybe, you know, if CCT TV cameras are being used, you might get one small sign that sort of tells you about this. This gives you much more information. It starts to create a shared language, and it gives you a way to actually find out more and to provide feedback. So that's a super quick and shallow introduction to the project. If you want some light reading, our, our plan for the project is called the Master Innovation and Development Plan. It's on our uh, Sidewalk Toronto website. It's a mere 1,500 pages with a mere 40 appendices. Um, but if you want even more uh, information, we will be actually at the end of this month publishing a digital, in a specific digital innovation appendix. A lot of the appendices are planning appendices. Um, uh, there's a lot of detail there already, but this is specifically about the digital architecture for the site. So that'll be on the website, it'll be public for everybody. So please um, read if you're interested. So thank you very much for a very thoughtful presentation. Uh, the next speaker is Jennifer Ding, who um, actually will complement this presentation quite well. Uh, Jennifer is uh, a solutions engineer at Numina, translating data into insights for Numina's partner cities around the world. Previously, she was the founder and CEO of Parkit, a, compu a computer vision company that developed algorithms to transform internet protocol cameras into a real-time parking data sensor Venture backed by Jaguar Land Rover, deployed across North America with major state universities, municipalities, and acquired by Numina in 2018. One of the things that uh, when you look into Numina and the work of Jennifer, they measure all forms of street level activity with a privacy first approach. So I know that many people with this last presentation think about privacy. And the mission is to make cities more responsive so they are safer, healthier, and more equitable. And one thing I really like about uh, looking at Jennifer's background, so you know, online and different things, and certainly Numina, there's a lot of discussion about privacy by design, intelligence without surveillance. And on their website, they say, we make cities more walkable, bikeable, equitable with data. So with that said, Jennifer, please come up. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today for this conversation on digital materiality. I'm Jennifer Ding from Numina. Um, today I'll talk a little bit about how we at Numina approach building the infrastructure and data platforms for creating street level data in a human centered and privacy first way. But first, a bit about my past prior to Numina. Um, so as a born and bred Texan, for the first 20 years of my life, this was my material environment. Cars were equivalent to transportation and a mobility challenge was getting stuck in traffic. 
So perhaps it wasn't surprising that when I founded a company, our uh, mission was to reduce the pain and energy waste of circling for parking. I applied what I was learning as an engineer to develop some computer vision algorithms to collect real-time parking data with cameras. The company was called Parkit, and we worked with parking operators like um, the University of Michigan, truck stops, truck stops in Oklahoma, and we worked with their cameras. Oftentimes, they already had IP cameras for security reasons, and we would just turn them into data collection tools. So it was a wild three years in parking, and by the end, I had not only become more aware of the wider world of mobility outside of cars, but um, had come to recognize the growing relationship between city streets and the digital technologies that were moving from the online to the offline worlds. So last year, I joined the Numina engineering team, and soon I realized that just like parking lots, where if you want to get data today, you usually manually count parking spaces, many aspects of our cities are still measured like this as well. So traditionally, yeah, it's, it's a familiar site, right? Um, so if you want to get pedestrian counts or impact studies, um, traffic engineers or interns will go outside with a clicker and a clipboard, or maybe a fancy tablet. And as you can imagine, this process is slow, inaccurate, and inexpensive. So oftentimes, we don't have good data on how people walk and bike in streets. And streets are then planned around what we do have good data on, which is cars. So in cities like the one I grew up in, um, tr the, uh, transportation becomes prohibitive and dangerous for other modes. So in joining Numina, one of the big things I learned was that the same technology, computer vision, can be shaped to achieve very different goals. Numina uses a camera as a sensor to measure all modes and streets. And right now, we focus on five main modes, pedestrians, bicycles, buses, trucks, and cars. But we're continually developing new object detectors, like wheelchairs, puddles, scooters, trash, dogs, you name it. If you can see it, we can measure it. And we don't just measure it, we also track the paths and behaviors of these objects. But perhaps the most important part of how we do this is that we do it in a privacy-first way. All of our imagery is processed on the device, our sensor, and we do not save or transmit video. Um, the data that we do save and transmit is anonymous movement data, so we don't need to collect personally identifiable information. We do save a small subset of images, a random image per sensor per hour, that's used for algor algorithm validation and training, but those are deleted after that process. So this, differenti this differentiates us from other camera-based traffic and smart city solutions. Uh, we are committed to providing intelligence without surveillance. As the camera networks expand across our cities, we believe it's important that this infrastructure is built with privacy by design to reduce the risk of use cases for the surveillance state, surveillance capitalism, or targeted hacking. Processing at the edge is also a much more affordable and scalable approach to urban sensing. So here's one of our sensors in Brooklyn. Um, our proprietary sensor is purpose-built for streets. It's designed so that cities can easily deploy it themselves, and they usually attach them to light poles with the same steel straps that any street sign uses. Because we start at the sensor, the data creation level, we can be the gatekeepers of what data is and isn't collected. So we can balance the value of real-time data without risking citizen privacy or data misuse. So, Often our users are urban and transportation planners, facility managers of the public realm, and they access our data through a web dashboard, which focuses on volume counts, path visualizations, and our, what we call the Numina behavior zones, which is our way of spatially filtering data. The behavior zones highlight another advantage of using a camera as a sensor. Instead of putting a tripwire or um, an array of sensors on each lane or road or sidewalk segment, you can draw behavior zones anywhere within the sensor field of view. So one new minute sensor can do the work of a street full of tripwires. We're also developing some new metrics like speeds, dwell time, and direction. Another way people can access our data is through our API which can be used to build new applications or trigger services in the street where needed, when needed. 
So for example, a retailer could use our API to get foot traffic alerts on um, activity in front of a specific storefront, or a sanitation department can trigger a trash pickup when, it, when trash reaches a certain level on the sidewalk, a common problem here in New York. Um, or an autonomous vehicle company may want the most up-to-date information on street conditions for the best routing. We just released a public API sandbox with data from downtown Brooklyn, so if there's any geospatial data junkies out there that want to play around with our data, please let me know. <laughs> so we're currently deployed in 15 cities in three countries, um, and we're about to have our fourth uh, country, um, our first Asian deployment. We sell directly to cities, but we also have customers in real estate, academia, parks, museums, business improvement districts, et cetera. So how do cities use our data today? So much of my work focuses on transforming our raw uh, movement data into actually interesting insights um, based on what the cities are, uh, the questions that the, the cities that we work with have. Um, and I call this translating data into human. So I'll start with some examples of desire lines or ways that people vote with their feet to identify the critical paths in a certain area. So here's one of our deployments in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. And we color each mode with a distinct color. Um, and pedestrians are green, bikes are blue, cars red. And most of the time, the activity we see in this plaza is just really all over the place. Um, it's just a sea mostly of green and blue, which is always exciting to see. But then one day, we saw that the paths had turned into this instead. And what had happened was a snowstorm, as many um, of the urban planning folks out there know, this is a great way to identify the critical paths that people use most often. Um, and in this case, it happened to be that bikes were mostly going across this horizontal line at the top of the image, and pedestrians were carving out these three main roads through the plaza. Um, and this data was important for the city so they could prioritize where to put um, new improvements, like a bench or a water fountain, and to understand where potential mode conflicts were occurring. Uh, between pedestrians and bikes that were crossing the same area. But perhaps a more critical desire line use case happened um, in Jacksonville, Florida, which at the time of our deployment had the highest pedestrian fatality rate in any major um, American city. There would be uh, miles between crosswalks. Um, and what we saw was that the desire paths um, really showed crossing activity all over the street. Um, but it was really concentrated in this one area. Um, so this data could help Jacksonville identify where they should put a crosswalk so that it could match current crossing behavior most closely. And now for a local example, downtown Brooklyn. Last fall, we deployed four sensors on the Fulton Pedestrian Mall. Um, we had 100% sensor uptime from November to April, about six months of data for 460 million data points of 26 million objects. The customer, Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, or DBP, had a lot of questions that they were interested in understanding um, what was happening at the street level, but one big focus was vis Vision Zero metrics, so specifically around road safety and traffic violations, and we were able to look into some of them using our behavior zones. So one big question was, what is the impact of construction on pedestrian safety? Um, during the fall, there's really construction all over Brooklyn, so this was a big question for them. Um, and just for a little bit of background, Fulton Mall is a two-lane road of two-way traffic, and there's just this constant negotiation between pedestrians, bikes, and vehicles for the sharing of the space. And so when there is like a small disruption, like a truck unloading for a few minutes, or a bigger disruption, like months of construction, this really impacts how the space is used and shared. Um, and this is something, of course, that DBP knew. This would have an impact, but the real question here was understanding qualitatively what behaviors were occurring, and also quantifying what the impact was on safety. And as you can see here, um, construction took place on the left side of the road, and um, scaffolding was erected over a significant portion of the sidewalk, and it actually shut down part of the sidewalk. And as a result, the pedestrians, which are those green dots, um, had to walk in the street to make their way down the road or cross in the middle of the street. 
So we looked at activity in that yellow zone, and what we found is that in the weeks that scaffolding was present, pedestrians were 53% more likely to walk in the road. Um, and this information, you know, could help DBP understand um, where they might put a temporary crosswalk or better signage in the future when construction does occur. Um, and something that I found significant was that this problem really scales up when you consider the city of New York as a whole, because at any given time we have over 300 miles of scaffolding. Another question that they asked was, where do cars driving on Fulton Pedestrian Mall come from? So this road is actually designated transit only, but if you're ever around there, you can definitely see private cars driving into Fulton Mall all the time. Um, so anecdotally, um, the customer um, had a theory that these cars were coming from a smaller side street, Hanover Place, which is um, the red zone. But actually, we found that in a week, of the 3,700 cars that were driving into Fulton Mall, 84% were actually coming from Flatbush Intersection. Um, so this data they can use to prioritize where to put signage, and um, another piece of information we shared with them was when the peak times were for these violations. So um, this they can use to understand when best to deploy enforcement. So to conclude, here is our team. We are passionate about cities and building technology to improve how we live and move in them. This year we're working on some exciting new projects like detecting trash around Grand Central, measuring exhibit engagement at a museum, and analyzing mode conflict at intersections. We are a mission-driven company dedicated to empowering cities with data and enabling the future with an API for streets. In this future, we imagine that cities are more connected, efficient, and equitable for all, and technology supports rather than inhibits this process. To learn more, uh, we have some, oops, um, some more information on our website. Um, on our blog, we have a detailed privacy policy explaining our rationale for um, how we do things the way we do, um, and some case studies from all around the world. And if you go to numida.co backslash API, we have our API sandbox there. Thank you very much, Jennifer. A um, lot to think about there. More questions for you coming down the road. Uh, the last speaker for this panel this morning is Vincent Lay. And he's actually going to complement the panel quite well because we'll have a discussion around the legal and regulatory frameworks when we think about uh, digital materiality. Vincent Lay is a technology equity attorney at the Greenlining Institute, where he develops greenlining strategy to protect consumer privacy, prevent algorithm bias, and close the digital divide. As an attorney, Lay works with the California legislature and Public Util Utilities Commission to pass laws and regulations ensuring that low-income communities have the same access to the technologies and tools that are vital to economic opportunity. Uh, when you look at the work of the Greenlining Institute, and certainly with uh, uh, Mr. Lay, you'll see that they spend a, quite a bit of time thinking about consumer privacy. Uh, they look at the modern and digital form of redlining and looking at uneven access to technology. And they look at the role of cities and businesses play uh, and, and this, these, using these technologies, whether it be GPS, broadband, connected sensors, cameras, and so forth, much of what Jennifer Ding just talked about. So at this point, I'd like to bring Vincent up to the stage. And thank you all for having me. Uh, um, like Mala said, I am a policy and regulatory attorney at the Greenlining Institute, and what I do is advocate for ways to use technology to close the racial wealth gap. Um, so, the green lining was formed about 25 years ago, and using an equity lens, we work across a lot of different policy areas, um, environment, transportation, technology, with the idea of improving social mobility and economic opportunity. And this is particularly, we focus on areas that are red light. Um, for a little history lesson, you probably may all know, um, red lining refers to policies where the government created lending maps, where they drew literal red lines around communities on the basis of race. Um, banks would evaluate mortgage lending risk, whether to give um, small business loans based on these maps. And, you know, areas that are red were deemed hazardous, and people living there couldn't get loans. And this refusal to lend, this refusal to lend is really key because access to credit 
uh, you know, whether to buy a house, to start a business, to fix your house, to you know, go to school, is key to economic equity in the United States. You know, you can survive on income, but wealth is what provides economic mobility, it, it lets you get financial security, it gives something for your kids when you pass. You know, so these overtly discriminatory policies um, lasted for 30 years, um, and from that time, that federal government backed $120 billion in loans, 98% of that went to white people. So if you put that in another way, for 30 years, Americans were, uh, white Americans were amassing intergenerational wealth, you know, to start homes, buy businesses, uh, buy homes, start businesses, and, you know, send their kids to college. And, you know, people of color were locked out of that opportunity. And that dynamic is the root of today's racial wealth gap, right? So for every dollar a white family has, a black family has eight cents. You know, these disparities are not accidents. These are uh, been deliberately caused by government policies. So as we think about how to reshape our cities using digital tools and new technologies, more data, it's important to keep this history in mind. So to me, you know, the potential of digital urbanism, right, this new way of understanding the ebb and flow of cities using technology and data, um, I think it's key to use that understanding to undo the effects of redlining. But before you can do that, let's focus on making sure we don't use this data to reinforce and recreate patterns of discrimination. Um, and an example I like to use um, are Amazon's prime delivery service maps. You know, a couple years ago, Bloomberg did an investigation of where Amazon provides services, right? Uh, and then this is what the, the delivery maps look like. So if you're black, you are twice as likely to be, live in an area where Amazon decided you don't get service. You know, so Amazon says it doesn't use race to build these maps. And I agree, I believe them. But the point is that the legacy of redlining and the geographic aspect of, racial, of the racial wealth gap means that you don't have to use race data to discriminate against people of color. Now, I know this isn't on the same level as you know, denying bank loans. This is denying you know, same-day delivery service. But the takeaway to me is that you know, some geographer, a data scientist, or engineer at one of the largest tech companies sat down and used all the latest data and tools and managed to make a map that discriminates in the same way that banks did in the 1930s. And you know, this is an example of algorithmic bias. You know, you can call it data analytics, you can call it AI, um, but to unpack all this, I'm just gonna really quickly talk about, you know, what are algorithms and where are they used? Um, to me, for the purpose of this discussion, an algorithm is just a set of, you know, a tool or computer model that processes data according to a set of rules, whether created by humans or by computers, um, and they can automate complex tasks. Um, and then why are they used is that we just have so much data volumes today. You know, there's just some examples up there about how much data they have. And we want to derive some value, some insights, you know, as um, data scientists say. So the idea is we can use algorithms to do that work for us. Um, and then, you know, the insight could be something like, you know, let's look at billions of rideshare uh, data from Uber, and they can find out, hey, women more than five miles away from home, you know, at night with a low battery are, you know, 25% more likely to accept a surge fare. You know, that's, that's the kind of insights that, you know, we're seeing this data being used for. And in terms of the data that's being collected, you know, that's relevant is, you know, like we, we've seen, it's cameras, it's urban sensors, it's mobility data, it's information from tweets and Facebook posts, likes, um, there's a lot of it. And they're being used everywhere, you know, for predictive policing, you know, for whether or not you get a bank loan, uh, whether or not you get a job. And, you know, what this happens, what happens from this is data-driven discrimination. You know, so we have new ways to analyze and process data to find patterns, but we have algorithmic bias by the end of the day because humans create the algorithms, humans influence the data that's made. And, you know, we can see that when we look at, you know, financial lending algorithms. It turns out, you know, even if you don't look at race, even if you don't have a person involved, 
um, online lenders still discriminate against people of color and they make them pay more even when controlling for you know the same economic factors like income you know for another quick example uh, let's let's just look at the number of you know men and women in tech companies can you imagine what will happen if we make an algorithm look at hiring data from you know say amazon to determine who to hire well we don't really have to guess because you know amazon made that tool and they found out hey um, that's biased against women and you know it's easy to see why because you know for 10 years Amazon was hiring mostly men and the algorithm learned hey men are the ones that Amazon likes to hire and to promote so we should hire men and you know the takeaway from that is you know these tools and data you know really let like well the analyzing this data um, and using algorithms you you can inherit really undesirable human traits like bias and discrimination. You know, and another aspect of this is, you know, when, when you're looking at data, you need to make sure that your data sets are representative. And, you know, an example of this is, you know, facial recognition algorithms are really bad at detecting black faces. And that's because the data sets that companies use just don't have enough black faces in them. And you know, that's an oversight that we you know, at Greenlighting make, want to make sure that when we use these technologies to benefit people, like that doesn't happen. And you know, that gets into algorithmic equity, right? So how to use data and algorithms in ways to reverse the effects of redlining and close the racial wealth gap. You know, and in the urban planning and mapping and the context here today, you know, it's really important because the biggest factor affecting economic opportunity and social mobility is the neighborhood you grew up in. So if you improve neighborhoods, then we can improve and address the legacy of redlining. And so how do you do that? Um, and you do that by optimizing for equity, right? You need to ask the right questions from your data. You know, we need to have, you need to guide your data use in a way that has value judgments that prioritize equity. And, uh, you know, one really local example I like to use is, you know, the Oakland bike plan, right? When Oakland tried to, you know, create new bike lanes uh, back in 2014, they had a lot of community opposition. And um, when they restarted that effort this year, um, they had a lot, they had a very equity-guided vision, you know, that asked, who do we want to build this for? Uh, what do we want to do? What are our goals? And you know, one of those is affordability. You know, the other one is safety. Um, and these are things that came out of the collaborative process and from asking the right questions of the data. The next way uh, we can do this is to ensure uh, equitable resource allocation. So we can use data tools and policymaking maps in a ways that identify disadvantaged communities and target those for greater investment, right? And the first way to do that is to have the tools. And you know, Greenlining sponsored legislation uh, a couple years back, where we made a mapping tool that looked at data from pollution sensors, health records, traffic data, socioeconomic data sets, to determine if a community was disadvantaged. And this is what happened. You know, we created, in effect, a, a redlining map without using race, which is really you know important from a legal perspective because you can't do that when you know, you're targeting investments. And you know, the, the next step you know, after identifying these disadvantaged communities is to build you know, an equitable resource allocation mechanism. And what we did was we, we passed laws in California that made 35% of California's you know, $9 billion cap and trade fund, 35% um, of that money is going to uh, communities identified as disadvantaged. Right, so you know the effects of that are that you know we've had 500 million dollars going to building, charging infrastructure in communities that, if you just looked at the historical data, you're like, no, well, you know, low-income people don't like electric cars, uh, so we shouldn't build charging infrastructure there. But you know, by building equity into design, you build um, a way to get to a future where you know low-income communities can use electric vehicles, they can charge their cars in their neighborhoods. So we think that's been really effective uh, to do that. And you know, just to contrast you know, uh, the Cal and Bio screen map, that mapping tool that we made, you know, with the you know, Amazon Prime maps, you know, in one, 
We have a mapping and data pro like tool and process applied in a way that denies services to communities of color that have been historically redlined. And then in the other way, um, we use mapping and data tools in a way to drive greater investments and economic opportunities in those same communities. Um, you know, to get back to the representative data sets issue, you know, like there's a big push to use more mobility data from Uber, from Lyft, from Rideshare. Um, and it's great, right? You can have a lot of insights, but if you think about the digital divide, you realize that, you know, the people who aren't represented in those data sets, who are much less likely to be represented in those data sets, are low-income people. So if you are using that data, you're going to prioritize you know, the needs and the, the patterns of the rich over the poor. And like that only reinforces redlining if you don't use this data correctly. And um, one big part of this is that we have all this data, but the, there's a temptation to say, oh, hey, we have enough data. We don't need uh, to actually go out and do the expensive process of talking to people. And you know, that's, that's wrong. That's so wrong. Um, and, you know, the Oakland bike plan, uh, you know, I, I really like this because it was a very equity forward um, process. And they, they said this about um, actually talking to Oaklanders. It was that we understand relying solely on quantitative data over the knowledge and experiences of marginalized communities can lead to incomplete decision making. And, you know, and that's true because not everything comes up from the data. You can't know about someone's lived experience by looking at, you know, an Excel, Excel spreadsheet. You know, luckily we, you know, there are tools being built to lower the costs of citizen participation, to lower the cost of outreach. But, you know, if you remember the digital divide, people who don't have smartphones, people who uh, don't have internet, aren't going to be able to use these tools. You know, so you really need to follow up this with, follow up this process with, um, you know, actual listening sessions. You need to go to where people are to gather data. And the Oakland Bike Plan did all of this. You know, they had very data-driven process where they, you know, surveyed thousands of people, but they also went to, you know, supermarkets, they went to, you know, encampments, they really talked to people all over the city to really understand and get feedback on the insights they were getting from their data. And I'm not going to touch on this too much because I'm running out of time, but, um, uh, you know, there's so many privacy concerns, right? So, you know, like the um, Tidewalk Labs said, you know, no data for data's sake, no technology for technology's sake. And, you know, I really agree because, you know, with all this information, you get more precise targeting. Um, you can really prey on vulnerable people. And, you know, you can get really deeper. You can start you know, analyzing people, analyzing people's, psych, you know, psychographic and behavioral results and get really creepy with it. And, uh, you know, you can see the end result of that, you know, in, in China, right, they're using facial recognition software to, you know, repress and limit the, the religious freedom of their Uyghur minorities. So as we think about where to use these tools, you know, it's important that we don't reduce people to numbers and we don't use these tools in ways that increase redlining and, and discrimination. <laughs> It's on, right? So you see that. Um, unfortunately, uh, the fourth panelist, Mimi Scheller, is under the weather. So at this time, I would love for the panelists to come up. So my first question is, is for you is first, you're, built, you're starting with a community that, or a piece of land that didn't really exist, right, in terms of a community. Uh, but the first practical question is around financing. So you're obviously a private entity and you're working with the city and so forth. Can you talk about just the financing around this type of development and just the basics of it? I mean, just in uh, terms of how, you, how it all came together, just who the partners are and whatnot. Um, that, I mean, that's actually something that's sort of underway at the moment because we handed in our proposal just in June. So the kind of economics of the site are actually sort of in deep discussion with Waterfront Toronto at the moment. But certainly we would be, uh, they've requested us and we're happy to work with local development partners as well. So we'd have probably other vertical developers working on some of the buildings of the site. Um, but, uh, you know, in some ways it's not unlike just normal real estate transactions where the city itself needs to decide sort of what they're interested in as outcomes for providing that land for, for private development and what the value that, of that is to them. Because certainly developing, and this is 
less about some of the digital elements, but just developing that kind of um, district infrastructure for energy, certainly geotech and, and things like that, is it's very expensive. It's more expensive um, to develop a green energy infrastructure than, than not. Um, it's more expensive to uh, provide affordable housing than not. So to be honest, in terms of the economics, it, it's, it's much like any other development project in that we need to come to a balance between a return on the project um, and what the city is looking at for the value of the site and what they're looking at in terms of what they'll get as outcomes from the site. So what I will say is we won't make money on Keyside. Um, it's a, a first signature project. We're more interested in being able to um, work on the implementation of so many new things. And so we're actually not, the economics don't pencil out very well for us, um, but we are, um, We've, we've proposed sort of further development on a next neighborhood as well to kind of balance that return. Um, but we're looking at certainly even an aggregate sort of like a below level normal return yeah. as a real estate company would. Okay. So my next question is probably on everyone's mind is about data. And I obviously, you know, you're a private firm and if I was to be the devil's advocate here, I'm sure you've sure. heard this question a million times. Uh, you know, it don't, doesn't seem like it could potentially be a conflict of interest if you're collecting this data. How do you also evaluate the project, right? So we know that these wonderful things come along and you have excellent metrics. I've looked at some of the things online, but how, who's doing the monitoring and evaluation? And then the second piece tied to that is who owns the data and how is that yeah. data being used? Yeah. And I'm kind of cheating here because it's not fair, but it's also tied to then what happens at some point if through the monitoring and evaluation, uh, uh, process, we find out that data has been misused or whatnot. What are the repercussions for that? So I know it's a, it's a three part question, and I can walk you through. Why don't we start first? Why don't we first start just with the monitoring evaluation? So you are the developer, uh, uh, you're working with the city certainly, and you have a number of metrics, and you say, here are our goals, and they're wonderful yes. goals, right? Yeah. So what hap who's making sure? Is it an outside yeah. entity or is it yourself? Yeah. Or is there a firewall between that to understand if you're meeting those goals? Yes, so um, certainly we don't believe it should be us. Um, in the proposal to Toronto, I mean, it, it, this really gets to that question of long-term capacity building with government because we shouldn't be self-regulating that. Um, but to be able to uh, monitor and measure that, government needs capacity to be able to do so. So um, we're actually in, that. this is one of the big things that we're debating with Waterfront Toronto now, because in the proposal, we actually proposed sort of a series of new entities. I mean, they would still be government, governmental entities, but there would be entities that would be stood up to, to really um, build up that capacity to be able to uh, have the oversight um, for what was happening on the project. You know, they're, they're slightly less comfortable with that, which I think is actually a great thing because what they're saying is our government agencies that exist today should be able to build up that capacity. So let's not think about new entities, let's think about which parts within the existing agencies can build up the capacity to be able to do that. Um, in the implementation of that practically, we also have proposed a number of different tools. So for example, for energy management, we're proposing to build a tool that we would then hand over to the government that would actually be able to sort of aggregate the energy data and, and show that we're meeting the metrics. So there's a need to be able to, you know, very practically to, to address how do you measure and make sure that you can measure if you're uh, proposing these kind of things, proposing metrics that we want to be held to. That was the first question. Second question was, Data, who owns the who data, how's it? Okay. Yes. So, um, so this is what uh, I touched on briefly in terms of data being a public asset. So we don't believe that any entity should be, certainly no private entity should be able to monopolize the data. So in, in all of the infrastructure designs that we're proposing, essentially the data would be, uh, there would be data standards that would be signed off with government. Uh, so it li literally the standards of how do you um, uh, organize and provide that data, the data would all be provided openly. So uh, whether it's an urban data trust or it's a, a existing government agency, some um, a body within an agency, um, they would have, they would essentially steward that data. Data that's coming out of all of the different systems would be provided to that organization, so then it could be openly used by, by any other entity, uh, whether it's government or other private entities to look at other sort of innovations on top of that data. Um, so that we think that's uh, incredibly important. And then the third question the was, what happens if Yes. Um, 
I mean, that, uh, that's something we're also sort of actively talking about now. Obviously, you need some sort of um, practical oversight. You need to be able to audit. You need to be able to prove that that's not happening, and you need to be able to hold organizations uh, accountable for it. So I, I don't have a quick answer for that today because it's something we're sort of actively working on, but that's to say that we agree that it's something needs to be actively worked on, and you need practical solutions for that. Fantastic. I appreciate it. So, Jennifer, why don't we switch to you? I think maybe you will be able to have a conversation here with Narissa. Certainly in your work, uh, you've talked about behavior zones and you collect anonymized data, right, and sort of how we can understand our social environments, how we can understand the built environment, the way people go throughout their daily lives. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the behavior zones and who are some of the people that have been coming to you to, to use your data or who have you in terms of partners and whatnot? Sure. Um, yeah, besides, I guess to address your last question, besides um, our direct customers who are usually um, city officials, so DOT or um, various other agencies um, in the in, uh, public agencies, um, we have worked with universities before. So um, uh, we did a program with New Lab that was a collaboration with some New York cities um, and we did some data sharing there. Um, I think definitely a big question on our mind is how to best open the data to the communities that we're actually monitoring in, uh, because completely agreed, um, this data is on their community. It's something that they should have access to. So that is kind of what we've been exploring with our API sandbox by opening up that downtown Brooklyn data. Um, and then... I well, that's good. Oh. That, that's like, oh, go ahead. Okay. Yes, please go ahead. <laughs> and then yeah. the behavior zones. Um, yeah, I think that goes in pretty well with the data. Um, people are interested in different aspects of the scene. So for example, um, at one of our deployments in Grand Central right now, the partner we're working with is completely interested in detecting trash, um, which is great. We're, we're happy to do that. But there's a lot of really interesting activity going on in the zone as well. For example, one of our sensors has a great view of a dedicated bus lane. Um, so we've had conversations with Transit Center, for example, with um, a lot of the new Better Bus Action Plan um, work to see if we can monitor some bus um, metrics about delays and maybe some violations of cars using the bus lane. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity, especially in some of our urban environments, to make the, the data, and especially the behavior zone data, um, available for more people that might be interested in using it. Great, that, that's a great segue. You actually touched a little bit on my next question, which was on community engagement. How is the public interacting with this data? Uh, I, I think you said you were in 15 cities and three countries. So how are you using that aggregate data to make better inform the work that you do? Or is there anything that you can say that you see that's cutting across either themes or some kind of similar challenges? Uh, I know it's a big question, but I was just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, we haven't done too much comparative analysis yet, but one big question that does come up, especially across our urban environments, is mode share versus road share. So this idea that how much space do we allocate to cars versus people, and how many people are actually um, using the space. So in New York, for example, um, I know New York DOT recently did a study where um, they found you know, the majority of space is definitely al allocated towards cars, but we have so many pedestrians and cyclists and transit users that are using the space. Mm -hmm. So how can we um, use the data on um, the number of commuters of these other modes to, to uh, make the case that we actually need to make more space on the road for these other modes? Um, so it's definitely interesting to compare across New York, for example, um, with uh, some of our pilots in the South, like Jacksonville or yes. New Orleans, where maybe they are a little more car friendly. Um, another thing that we're starting to look at is um, modal interactions, so how uh, pedestrians might interact with cars or bikes, and um, something that we know um, in New York, we're all very aggressive commuters, so uh, one question is about yielding behavior. Um, we are going to be de deploying in Portland soon, and we know that their uh, driver characteristics are more willing to yield um, to pedestrians, so um, this is something that we've heard through conversations with the city, but something that we'd also love to actually measure quantitatively to see um, how that might actually affect safety in deeper ways. 
I wanted to say Please. like how excited we are about technologies like Numina because in all of the use cases we're looking at for streets or for public realm, these days with the development of technologies like this, which are you know protecting people's data privacy, we can actually implement every single use case except one and not with with pri private data. Essentially, you know everything that we're looking at, counting the cars coming in for pickup and drop off, whether it's that or whether it's park usage, it can all be done without collecting any sort of personal data from people and scrubbing it before that data goes anywhere. So yes. that's really, we think it was a, a game changer in terms of being able to use um, tech responsibly in public space. Yeah. So. Yeah. Great. All right, why don't I, oh, go please jump in. Yeah, that. So, in, I, I'm not a data scientist, so isn't it possible that you can take that anonymized data, and it's, it's really easy to de-identify data these days, and you, you, you add that to someone's location data from their cell phone, maybe because they had Google Maps open, and couldn't you like, identify people um, and where they travel and put all that together um, and look at maybe that person doesn't yield a lot, and then you get like an email from the government saying, hey, you didn't yield. And they take that data with your you know, behavioral data to, to craft a message in a way that is like most designed to make you feel bad. You know, is, that, is that possible? Um, yeah, it is. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but I mean, I guess that's the point, uh, and I know everything was shallow and quick, but that's the point of having a process, like a, a responsible data use assessment. Because in that assessment, you're committing to what you are and what you're not doing with the data. That you know, that's, would be a regulated assessment. So if you said you're gonna do X, Y, Z with the data, you're not doing A, B, C, or you know, you're not taking it and then multi, you know, uh, matching with other data sets to identify people. And, and yes, then you have to make sure that people aren't breaking what they've said they're gonna do, right. but it's, it's providing that transparency as to what the data is gonna be used for and committing to not use it in other ways. So that's why those processes and that oversight is so important, because you can do that kind of stuff, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Vincent, why don't you continue along those lines? I mean, one of the, <laughs> I, I could just go sit down with a bucket of popcorn and just watch it. Uh, <laughs> why am I here? No, this is great. Uh, so, I mean, you've talked a lot about, you know, you started out with redlining, and certainly it's a very serious issue, we know, and, and um, you know, uh, when we thought about what some of the solutions, obviously it was legal and regulatory, whether it be the Community and Reinvestment Act or the Fair Housing Laws, or just discriminatory laws on the books and so forth. And then, you know, I think about my, when I started out with framing today's discussion, uh, the time at MIT where we're talking about the digital divide and who has access to technology and so forth, and now you've talked about algorithm, algorithmic equity, um, which is an important concept. So I'm curious about solutions. I know you talked a lot, quite a bit, like the Cal and Viro scan uh, certainly is an example of how you can use technology and information to sort of better inform the public and engage with people. Uh, but when you think, but some of the things you presented, not only going from the legal and regulatory, but also down to the production and the innovation of the technologies themselves. So I was curious of how at Greenlining and the work that you do, are you partnering with the private sector, whether it be Amazon, whether it be Twitter, Facebook, what have you, to kind to address some of the issues that you've discussed? Right. So. I think we work a lot on uh, capacity building in government agencies, right? So we want um, your regulators, your, you know, your government, your legislators to know how to process these data. They don't, I mean, we don't want uh, the regulators to just take companies at their word, right? So that's one big part of it. Um, another part of it is creating the legal framework. So California um, in January is gonna have one of the strictest privacy laws um, go into effect. Um, and we hope that becomes the standard. It's kind of based off um, GDPR in Europe, and that gives a lot of people more control over um, their data and their privacy. But in terms of, you know, there are, of, of actual solutions, um, you know, I think we really need to change a lot of the civil rights laws that we have, um, you know, because we have laws in the books that prevent disparate impact, right? So if you see, we, look, we work with a lot of bankers, right? We look at a lot of bank data and you know, getting more transparency in data is really important. Um, you know, we, there was a Freedom of Information Act with um, you know, banks and insurers and they found out that you know, insurance companies were charging minority neighborhoods twice, more than twice as much um, despite having the same driving records, right? So we need, first we need data from these companies and we need the capacity from our regulators to analyze that. And that's a really important part. But they're also like within companies, there are statistical techniques 
to address um, you know, racism and redlining in the data, um, but using a lot of them. So say you find out your banking algorithm discriminates against people of color. You can't legally fix that by saying, okay, we'll give you know, all these black people and like, you know, all these Latino people a bonus in their algorithmic score. That's also illegal because that violates the Equal Protection Clause. Right? So we have two really competing laws that say like, once you recognize that your, your data and your results are racist, it's illegal for you to have a race-based way of fixing it. So you know, that's why Cowell and Viroscreen was an important tool, race neutral, but still generates equity for you know, uh, communities of color. But I think in a larger scale, we really need to rethink our you know, civil rights laws to address Great. this. Okay. So I, I have a question for all of you, and it's tied uh, to the earlier discussions. Each of you brought this up. And when we think about uh, planning, development, design, all those things, we also, many of you oftentimes discuss process. And I'm curious, not only with your partners, whether it be government entities, the private sector, and so forth, but what is your process to ensuring, uh, if you think about today's society, and certainly strong market cities, like Toronto and New York, uh, Beijing, New London, whatever it is, the level of inequities, right? And you all discuss in many ways the importance of creating either, a you've mentioned quality of life, you've mentioned healthier communities, economic opportunity, educational opportunity, all these wonderful things, but through the process that you're working on, can you talk about how you're actually embedding that in the work that you do through these processes? Sure, I mean, I think the affordable housing example I gave is, is maybe the most um, obvious one, but you know, I think a typical developer, if they sort of developed the kind of mechanisms to build at these lower rates would simply take that money and it would be, you know, profit on their bottom line. But we don't, we really are not interested in building sort of wealthy enclaves. That's what's got, you know, that's a huge problem in the last 20 or 30 years in cities as populations have moved back in. We're really interested in building um, communities where everyone can live. So, you know, that's part of the reason our project doesn't pencil out, you know, for the first one, is that we're, we're not interested in building something that's not going to have that component to it. Uh, and so we, we think by being able to provide as much affordable housing as possible, we'll end up with a much more diverse neighborhood, and that'll make it a, a stronger and more interesting and, and vibrant place. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, <laughs> this is an interesting question because, I mean, I guess our work is to get other people to embed equity in their work, right? So that means that's going to you know, the California Senate, it's going to the FCC, it's going to policymakers, legislators, mm -hmm. and building coalitions where we can pressure these you know, decision makers to implement the laws um, and, and the rules that we need to kind of force uh, people to consider equity and um, in their design of things. And you know, this is part of it, right? You know, it's like teaching people about um, what are the impacts of all these new technologies? And I think it's an iterative process, but with enough time, we can get the momentum we need to really shift the legal landscape, the regulatory landscape, so that you know, by design, you embed equity into your you know, data use. Jennifer? Yeah, um, I think the, the first kind of challenge that Numina started uh, or hoped to address was to um, look at equity of mode. So um, we need to, you know, increase our data sets not on, um, you know, car users, car owners, but also other users of the streets. Mm -hmm. So that was a starting point. I think mm -hmm. probably the biggest procedural decision we've made is that um, we do focus on working directly with cities. So in that way, we hope that um, the groups that are, we are working with are representing their citizens' interests um, and taking into account the context of um, what really goes on there. So for example, um, I recently heard a presentation by the Oakland DOT about um, uh, increasing bike use there, but a big point that they made was just that, um, I mean, in many of these neighborhoods, access to transit or bikes might not be possible. So um, not only is car use sometimes necessary, but it's also a big part of culture and identity. So I think just having that local context and understanding it's not like always cars are bad or always transit is the solution, but um, embedding the data in the context of the community to tell the stories and decide what metrics to focus on is um, a big focus of ours. Fantastic. So we have about 10 minutes left and I would love to hear some questions from the audience. There's a microphone going around this gentleman here. Thank you very much. I'm Jack Eichenbaum. I am the founder of something called Gizmo, 
which is about data, geographic information systems. This is a question for Mr. Lay. The process of um, redlining was reached its peak in the 50s and early 60s. But there are precedents that help that happen, that go back to the 1920s. Particularly, I'm thinking of one, the informal steering of, of realtors by race and color and ethnicity, whatever, away from certain user, away from certain sellers and landlords to other sellers. But most importantly, I'm thinking of something called restrictive covenants, which happened all over this country and in New York City in the 1920s, where land was developed and restricted to just white people or restricted against people of certain faiths, Jews and Catholics, and certainly people of certain colors. Half of the city of Seattle was laid out in such a way as North Seattle could not, in this one is, could not be sold to people who were black. New York City, Jackson Heights Garden Apartments, could, many of them could not be sold to people of certain faiths, of certain colors, and the same thing was true of the co-op apartments on Fifth Avenue, Central Park West, and Park Avenue. That's a precedent for something that creates the blockbusting. Any comments on that? Did you study restrictive covenants? Yeah, so I mean, I think restrictive covenants are the other half of redlining, right? So you, you put those two together, you get urban blight because you know in black neighborhoods, there was a lot of white owners, right? And those white owners knew, hey, um, my residents, you know, my renters can't move anywhere, so why do I need to fix my house? I'll just let it fall into ruin. And you know, the black, uh, people who actually own homes in that neighborhood, they saw their property values decrease, right? And because all the houses around them that were owned by white people and rented out to black people were falling apart. So that creates urban blight. When, and then when they created the interstate system, city planners are like, oh, you know, these areas, these black areas, these redlined areas are blighted. They're, you know, they're slums, they're ghettos. So let's just build a freeway through them. And you know, that created a lot of urban issues that we see today, you know, suburban sprawl. Um, you know, pollution. So all of those things go into why, uh, you know, the restrictive covenants and redlining go into why no one has wealth today. And in, in terms of solutions, you know, um, the Equality of Opportunity Project that found that, you know, what neighborhood you grew up in is uh, the biggest predictor of social mobility. One of their primary solution is that we need to reintegrate neighborhoods um, and to re, you know, because restrictive co covenants, you know, codified segregation. We need to reintegrate neighborhoods. And I think the challenge today that we all deal with is how to do that without, you know, displacement, without all the negative effects of gentrification. Thank you. Let's go to the gentleman here and then I'll take Sh Short question. What's the role of the courts, especially the federal courts, Supreme Court of this? Are there any cases? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I kind of touched on this earlier. Um, there was a, there's a Supreme Court case called Rizzo that pretty much made it very difficult uh, and if not illegal to correct for algorithmic discrimination uh, on a race-based um, way. So, you know, that's the, how the court interpreted the Equal Protection Clause and the disparate impact um, laws that we have on the books. And that's the law of the land until we change um, you know, the way that we think about disparate impact and equal protection. Hi, so I'm Renee Sieber. I'll be talking later today. Um, so I have read all 1,400 pages <laughs> <laughs> of the MIDP. Oh my, um, my question is, it's a call to action. So I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Um, what are we, mostly urban planners, going to do? I'm in geography, but my PhD is in urban planning. What are we going to do after this conference? Um, so much of the time, I see the plans of action being outsourced to lawyers as though litigation and laws are the only solution. And I don't know, maybe it's a structural defect in planning. Remember, I am a planner. But, you know, that we speak to the powers that be, but I think so often we're just seduced by the technology 
and um, oh, the data is out there, there's nothing we can do, but where is the Gandalf in all of us? You shall not pass, you know? You shall not use this data set because in an era of automated decision making, there's no such thing as anonymity anymore. Excellent question, thank you. Why don't all three panelists uh, respond to that? Um, the core of the question being what, what should we, how should we act? Urban planners. Urban planners. Um, well, I mean, I guess that's why I wanted to present the material in the way I did, which is to say that, you know, digital technology and data is, is potentially a mixed blessing. And so when we think about developing places, we have to think about them holistically. And some of the most important things you can do are not related to digital things. And we have to find a balance of all of that. Um, and then we have to do it ethically. So, I mean, personally, I think that's what we're trying to do at our firm. It's often hard for people to believe because we're a private company. But we're a private company of people who come from urban planning backgrounds and governmental backgrounds. So we're a mission-driven company as well. Um, and I think we are actually trying to do that by the, by the project itself and the way that we're designing it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we rely on lawyers, you know, it's, it's job security, I guess, because urban planners, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's, we, we're kind of the middleman, right, between the data scientists and the planners and the, the policy makers, right? And you kind of need um, groups like Greenlining and you know, other lawyers and to, to translate the learnings and, and the insights and the, the negative effects of that into effective policy. And you know, I wish that wasn't the case. Um, and you know, I think of some solutions to do that is like we always advocate for you know, diverse and inclusive teams as a way to see you know, your blind spots, right? Because I don't think you know, in a lot of these cases that I presented, no one was, you know, uh, I don't think people went into it with like, hey, I'm gonna go discriminate against black people, right? But there are blind spots, you know, like, hey, I'm gonna use data sets that only have white faces. But when everyone on your team you know, comes from the same background, um, you kind of create blind spots that prevent you from self-regulating. Uh, yeah, um, as someone in tech, definitely very, very well aware that the fact that legislation will be lagging, right? The algorithms, the data sets will be produced and developed and um, the, the pace is just not something that can be matched. Um, I think legislation definitely has its place and I hope, um, I mean, we are seeing a lot of anti-facial recognition legislation happening now, but of course there's more than just faces that can be used to identify a specific person, right? There's a lot of different um, forms of data and regulating every single one, um, especially if every single city has to make their own legislation, is just not really something um, that is going to protect uh, citizens. So I guess um, as a company that does work with planners a lot of the time, I think um, our big ask is if we can find ways to work more closely together. Because I think for us, we think of ourselves as um, hardware and software providers, right? But um, the data we do create and collect um, should be shaped by um, both planners and hopefully citizens too. So I think there's amount of guidance um, that, that should happen in this, this relationship. As a professor, it's so hard to be quiet on that question. It's a great question. <laughs> I would just say, think about where change happens, and I would say it's a multifaceted approach. It takes lawyers, community organizers, developers, architects, so forth. But anyway, um, these are all great responses. Excellent question. We, we unfortunately don't have time for any more audience questions, but I do want to ask the panelists one last thing. When you think about your work, your individual work, whether it be at Sidewalk Toronto or just Sidewalk Labs in general, what is the one challenge that you're grappling with the most? What keeps you up when thinking about the future of where we're going when we think about digital materiality, um, and equity, all health, all the things that you've laid out for all of you? Just uh, sort of 30 seconds if you can. I know it's a big question, but. And we can start in this order. You know, I always feel like, <laughs> said, we're always going to you. Why don't we, Jennifer, why don't we start with you and we'll work our way that way if you don't mind. Totally. Um, I think the expanding camera networks, both fixed and mobile, is, is one of the most terrifying things for us. Um, so not just CCTV cameras that we already know are all around us, but um, the phones that we carry, um, the invisible sensors that are around us, um, 
these are increasing. And um, in some, for some kinds of data, I, I think we do have some protection, but for others, we really don't. And so I guess what we're hoping to see more of is a stronger either um, legislative or even industry-focused set of baby code of ethics or set of standards that can um, help set a common um, understanding of what should and shouldn't be done. I think maybe what should is a little fuzzy right now, but what shouldn't is becoming to be clear. Thank you. Yeah, what keeps me up at night is that like we don't know what we don't know, right? Like the all this investigative reporting was behind the examples that we found. There were whistleblowers, you know. So um, that's how we found out that insurance companies charge, you know, black people twice as much. This is how we found out that um, open data sets were how we found out that banks were discriminating against, um, you know, people of color. So the thing is, a lot of data isn't open and it's not free. It isn't. Um, transparent, there's no accountability. So I, you know, I wanna build mechanisms where there's like some sandboxes where regulators can look at the data without you know, infringing on trade secrets and um, you know, all these, the, what private companies complain about when we ask for transparency so that they can actually look at and find out uh, what's going on and what's going wrong. And you know, just even the threat of that can, can ensure compliance. So that's what I hope to do. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think my answer would be very similar. Um, you know, it's amazing when you look at what's already implemented today, and as I was saying earlier, the kind of invisible layer, the invisibility of all of it um, on the street and out in public spaces. And so how can we work to really provide that transparency? Um, I mean, also for me, I think as we, what keeps me up at night is as we, it's a lot about equity, as we think about what we're, proposing to develop in this neighborhood, there are, in the vast majority of the cases, there are, um, we can collect data anonymously, uh, we can protect people's privacy, we have no interest in surveillance cameras, um, but some of the larger infrastructure systems essentially would run the district, and so is there truly, if you, come and live in the district, you can choose to live there if you're a wealthy person, but you can't if you're going to come and live in affordable housing. So that raises real ethical questions of equity. And if we run an energy system that has AI built into it, you can't necessarily opt out of that. And so we're really grappling with what does that mean? Like, could we provide opt out, meaningful ways to opt out of that um, that wouldn't penalize somebody? And so, to be honest, those are the ones I think about a lot because, you know, I'm happy to say that 95% of what we're doing is going to be anonymous. It's like, I, I truly ethically believe there's no issue with it, but there are a couple of these use cases where, because I'm so focused on environmental protection and, and that being mm -hmm. incredibly important to me, the trade-off, it, well, it doesn't have to be, the point is it shouldn't be a trade-off between aiming for climate positive and having systems that can help you get there, but protecting people's rights and, and equity. So that, that keeps me up at night. Fantastic, so with that, we'll end this uh, panel discussion, but I wanna thank Jennifer, Vincent, and Aressa for a thought-provoking presentation and discussion, and thank you very much. And I would encourage you to look at our colleague's work, Mimi Scheller, who could not be here today because she's under the weather, but to see the work that she also does and how well it complements the wonderful work of our colleagues on stage today. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm.